the Dark Minds podcast. A warm, friendly, comfortable home for the creators of horror, horror, horror. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Oh, I was going to say Mr. Jennifer Ann Gordon. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> well, Mr. Jennifer Ann Gordon is in the house helping me do the interview today. How are you doing, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm great. I'm great. I feel like every time I join the show with you, Alan, I get like a different strange nickname. First it was Peaches. You're then still you were, Peaches. I, and then I was very, very deliberately Jennifer Ann Gordon with a stress on the Ann. Now, now Mr. I kind of like just Mr. Mr. Peaches. Mr. Peaches. <laughs> Mr. Peaches. <laughs> You know what, oh my God. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I feel like Mr. Peaches needs to be the name of the demon in your next story. I, you know, what's, so I am actually, this all, now it's all going to be about me. I am writing um, a demon-ish story, we will say. And uh, yeah, I've been toying with different names and Mr. Peaches just Mr. quickly Peaches. got to the top of the list. Yeah, think about it. You're a peach. Well, well we're here. And um, what can I say? Uh, joining us, we've got an author, a New York Times best-selling author, Christopher Golden, and he's got a new book called The House of Last Resort. So thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Mr. Man of Mysteries. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Is that's that ever Mr. Peaches, Mr. Man of Mystery. I'm really Mrs. Man of Mystery. <laughs> 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 they got that wrong, but they wouldn't <laughs> They didn't believe me when I said that. Uh, no. And I said, yes, I am. I was fighting with the photographer. But anyway. So w what's going on with you? Like, why Why are you a writer? Like, who hurt you when you were <laughs> You know, um, that's a long story. Uh, I think everybody has an answer to that story. But horror-wise, I, I don't know. I mean, when I was a kid, my mom used to say, um, why can't you write something good? And by, my mother still says that about my yeah. mother. <laughs> well, no, but by good, she meant, why couldn't I write something nice? And I said, I, I've written romantic stories and science fiction stories and Western stories, but um, somebody always dies, and it turns into a horror story. And, you know, that was just the stuff I gravitated toward, whether it was on television or in the movies or in comic books, and then, of course, in books. Uh, if it had monsters in it, if it had uh, terror in it, weirdness, you know, mystery, uh, you know, I was too young to have seen the Twilight Zone when it was first on, but of course it was on in reruns when I was a kid, and I just devoured it. You know, so many things, but uh, as far as who hurt me, that's a whole nother session. Uh, and I, <laughs> I don't know that yeah. you, 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 you the time. pay for that God. session. Yeah, no, 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 we'll sit down and relax here, and let's just, <laughs> I'll open up a cocktail, and let's go. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, ten hours later. Yeah, ten oh, hours yeah, later. By the way, Chris, can you tell us about your book? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's crying, laying on the floor. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what what about horror? Do you think that you like or focus on so much? Like, what when someone picks up one of your books and one of your horror, are they getting suspense and terror, Alfred Hitchcockish, or are they kind of getting slap and gore, kind of like? Jennifer Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't shy away from gore, but it's not my goal ever. You know, it's it's there when it naturally occurs in the story. Uh, but for me, you know, like, uh, again, you know, I've, I've talked about this a couple times recently that the first time I can remember being frightened by something uh, I saw or read was actually um, watching the original Frankenstein with Boris Karloff, the universal one, and I was uh, out on the back porch of my house, watching on a little black and white TV. I was seven years old, and the monster is playing. Um, you know, uh, she loves me, she loves me not with the with the flower with the little girl, and they run on the petals on the flower, and he picks her up. And although they don't show him throw her into the pond, you know that he does. And because he's uh, he has a simple mind, the mind of a very small child, you cut to him walking down the, the center of the town, holding the, the, the soaking wet corpse of this little girl, and the confusion and sadness and fear on his face, I wasn't afraid of that, but I was horrified. And so to me, that's kind of the moment, I think, when I thought, oh, well, this is an emotional level that is not easy to achieve, 
This is uncommon. And, I, and, and you add to that fear, which is so uh, uh, cathartic. You know, uh, so many times there have been studies about comedy and horror and how the, the effect of great laughter in a, in a comedic film or television show is very similar to the effect of having been terrified by watching something like that um, because you have this experience, this heightened emotional state, and then you get to exhale, to relax out of it. If you're reading a book, you get to close the book. And so I think that that is the high that I was, that I was always searching for as a consumer of, of fiction and also, I think, as a storyteller. Yeah, so that's my... That's my spiel. I would have threw her in, too, myself. But <laughs> yeah. I, think, I, I don't know why. When I see it, I think, yeah, push her in there. <laughs> <laughs> she could have been sassing back. <laughs> so, Chris, last time you and I talked, you know, we tried to jokingly figure out how many books you've written, and it's, you know, well over 50. So, obviously, you dabble in all sorts of types of horror. Is there something that you, like a line you won't cross, something that is too dark even for you? You know, as a writer, that's a good question. I mean, as, as a consumer of these stories, as, a, as an audience member, there are definitely things that I don't want. But as, as a writer, there are probably places I would go that I wouldn't want to read myself, but only to accomplish something in the story, not in a, a, you know, in a way that is, um, you know, just over the top or done for effect. Right, not just to be, oh, taboo. You, you know, you won't see, I have certainly killed children in my fiction, uh, but you won't see pedophilia in my stories, and I know that there are extreme horror stories where anything can happen. You know, you're much more likely to see a pedophile eviscerated. And I don't know, I think I'd certainly, like, I, I typically do write, if I'm writing a horror story, typically they're supernatural, because that's much more interesting to me. Um, I do write non-horror stories that are thrillers and things like that, that that don't have the supernatural element, obviously. But that changes the, the tone of the story for me. The, you know, this, the stories that are about, you know, um, people who rent a cabin and, you know, strangers come in and murder them all in horrifying ways um, are just not of interest to me in any way. Well, they've been done so many times. Like... Yeah, and, and also I just feel like that can happen. Um, you know, I'm not. I was just about to say that that can happen. Yeah, it's like a a thing that we read about in, in the news. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not interested in that kind of. Uh, I'm interested in other kinds of real life horror, but I'm not interested in that kind of real life horror. I'm interested in loss and relationships and 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 those kinds of things, and definitely not interested in um, in that kind of thing. It's just not my. You know, the world is bad enough. <laughs> What is? I didn't notice. Yeah. Uh, but well, when you say it, you're talking about loss and things like that, is that kind of the meaning behind what you write? Is there a subtext? Like it, you know, when we talk to a lot of crime writers, there's always some sort of justice meaning or some sort of thing that they want people to get. You know, it won't be necessarily political, but it's some sort of you know policing or some sort of thing. A lot of times. Yeah, you know, there isn't any one thing. I don't think, but I do find that. I usually get about halfway or two thirds of the way through a book before I realize what I'm actually writing about and what the theme has been all along. And then I go back to the beginning and I revise with that in mind, realizing, oh, I'm actually writing about the loss of identity that comes from dementia or Alzheimer's disease, or I'm writing about, um, you know, the loss of a child or, or, um, or anything like that, or, you know, um, or how difficult it is to have relationships in the 21st century, you know, like whatever it might be, I haven't discovered it until I'm well into the book. You know, the, the value of second chances, and, you know, but I do always end up finding that I'm, I'm talking about something. But, and why supernatural? Like, are, are, are you one of those that, are you married to a ghost or something? I don't know. I mean, Jennifer, I don't know if you've met my wife, so I uh, haven't. We'll have to, I was just um, like, oh. we'll have to ask some of the people who think they've met her, and they can tell us I whether know, she's like. Actually... I'll just like text Tony Trembley right now and see. Yeah, see, does she actually exist? Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, you know, um, for me, I saw so I I refer to myself as a Christian atheist, which means that I was raised for twelve years. Well, I, I was raised in in the Catholic Church. I went to Catholic school for twelve years. Uh, I, while I don't believe that uh, there is a God, the kind of God that, that modern religion believes in, I do believe in the things that I was taught 
uh, were part of Christian ethics, when, not Christian ethics of the 21st century, which involve um, hating anybody who's different from you, but the Christian ethics of do unto others as you would have them do unto you, love your neighbor, all of those things. I feel like when I'm writing a supernatural story, and ironically, perhaps, I don't believe in the supernatural at all, but I do think that in some weird way, if I can get you to suspend your disbelief, or even more so, if I can get you to believe for five seconds that a ghost could be real, or that demons could be real, or that some ancient, you know, evil might be real, whatever it could be, that means for those five seconds you also have to believe that there could be some larger goodness, some, some divinity, some angelic presence of whatever kind you want to say. And I think that the willingness to believe in better things is a gift. You know, I don't know. It's a, it's a, there's a long way around to that way of thinking, but, um, but it really is part of what appeals to me about these kinds of stories. Plus, I just like to scare the crap out of people. Yeah, I mean, that's just a, an addictive thing to be able to do, I think, to people. It's just like, oh, it's really great to scare But nothing's better. You know, it's better than people saying they were scared from reading something that you wrote is the few times that I've actually been told that what I wrote made people cry. There's no better, no better compliment can be paid to a writer than, than that you were brought to a, a heightened enough emotional state that you cried. Uh, so we, I know we haven't really talked too much about the House of Last Resort, so obviously I want you to talk about the House of Last Resort. Yeah. Tell us about it um, and how that relates, because this is what made my, my brain kind of catch on fire for a second about, like, your Catholic upbringing and how that influenced the House of Last Resort. So, obviously, tell us about the House of Last Resort, and then... The House of Last Resort is the story of a young American couple who, like so many young American couples these days, uh, are um, remote workers, so they have the ability to live any place they want, uh, and they encounter um, a very real phenomenon, which is that uh, all over Italy, and in this case it's Sicily, and in some other countries around the world, you could buy uh, a vacant home for a single euro. So there are places in Italy where you can buy a home for a euro as long as you promise that, you know, you're not going to rent it out. You'll have to live there yourself for at least five years. And you'll have to um, spend at least, I think, 50,000 euro or something like that, depending on the circumstances, to, to renovate that place. Um, and this is because there are lots of places that have been sort of abandoned by their population, young people leave to go to cities. And so these old sort of hill towns and places like that um, are on their way to becoming ghost towns. And to sort of restore that town with some vibrancy, they invite people from all over the world to come and live there. And so this couple's like, well, hang on. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that? And this is what I think, too. I look at it, if we didn't have the roots that we have, uh, I'd be like, why? why would we not go to... Italy and buy a house for a euro. Unfortunately for them, the house that they buy uh, has a history that they're not aware of uh, that's connected to, uh, well, we're going to talk about it, but I don't want to go too much into detail, that's connected to the Vatican that has a history that involves exorcism. So we'll leave it at that. that. So as far as my Catholic upbringing is concerned, you know, I, in a weird way, I used to say that um, 12 years of Catholic school mostly taught me how to get away with stuff. And I think that that's probably true in some ways about fiction that I've written that involves this sort of thing. It's, you know, it taught me mythology of Catholicism. And I say that the same way I would say any other mythology. The, what, you know, what are, who are the, the heroes? You know, what are, what are the stories? What are the legends? What are the, what are the monsters, right? Um, and so it's, it's a very fertile territory to play with. Um, and in this case... I I just like to take kind of tropes and twist them around and do them a little bit differently. Now, when you were a kid during your you know twelve years of Catholic school, did you believe in like did you believe in the demons then? No. Because I I'll say I'm also like a, re a lapsed Catholic, a former Catholic, a Christian atheist, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but you know, I think I was raised to be so scared of demons that even now, like writing a demon story, I'm just like maybe I shouldn't do this, even though I don't <laughs> believe in it now. That little kid part of me is still saying, but what if, you know, what if Sister Melinda was right? Yeah. You had a Sister Melinda? She was my first grade teacher. That seems like a strange name for a nun. 
Yeah, she was, you know, she's everything you would expect a, a first grade teacher to be. Yeah. When it was still okay to hit kids. Oh, yeah, no, I had a lot of great nuns. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, that could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that clip and just play it as a ad. Yeah, please I have do. A lot yeah, of great I nuns. Start, that's the, that's the sound you know bite for today's please show. Please start that rumor. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did you know that about Chris Golden? Yeah. I mean, just <laughs> it's his... immaculate with Sydney Sweeney. Um, well, I mean, that's a very specific kind of yes. not. Horror, horror movie nuns tend to be pretty hot. That's all. Oh, they're hot. <laughs> I'm like, had Sister Melinda been like that, I would have been fine with her hitting me. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be taking her clothes off while you should be. <laughs> um, oh. So. The interesting thing is I don't, you know, I, I never thought too much about God. I just sort of took it for granted, I think, when I was in school. But I don't think I ever believed in hell. Um, and I don't think I ever necessarily believed in demons. Um, you know, I think the first time I saw The Exorcist, it did creep me out. But I think I also go by, I, I, I refer, I've referred to this so many times, so it made a massive uh, uh, impact on me. Uh, there was a terrible TV movie in, I assume, the late 70s, but I have to look it up, called something like Death Ship or something. We'd have to look it up. But it was a TV movie, um, and they find this the sarcophagus of the Antichrist, if I'm remembering it correctly, at the bottom of the sea, and they, they, they hoist it out of the water. But there's a conversation between two characters in this absolutely awful TV movie where they're talking about whether they believe in God and whether they believe in the devil and, you know, and this one character says, uh, there is a devil, of that there is no doubt. But is he trying to get in us, or is he trying to get out? Which sort of, you know, implies, well, we are the devil. You know, we're the, you know, we're the evil that's out there. Uh, and I think that that stuck with me. And I, I, so I don't, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't think I was ever afraid of the idea of demons. Except, you know, in, while I'm watching a movie that I'm afraid of. Which point of view do you write from? Like which character or both? Um, how do you tackle this story? Um, well, this story uh, is is third person uh, limited. I do switch characters, um, which is which is I think when I'm writing novels that is usually how I do it. I, I move from character to character um, so that we get fuller sensory experience of what's going on in the story. Do you have a pattern or a style, a way you do that so that people don't get confused? Uh, I think when there when there aren't too many characters you or aren't too many point of view characters, uh, then it's easier. Like I think the the novel I'm finishing like this week actually, I should be delivering it hopefully Friday has I think four point of view characters. But I wrote a novel a couple of years ago called All Hallows. I was just about to bring that up. Yeah, to be like which, you wrote an epic that had a lot of characters. Yeah, well, funny, funnily enough, Jennifer, it's it's not that long a book. Um, but it is a very busy book, and it has lots of point-of-view characters. Again, third-person point-of-view characters. But in that case, uh, every scene is a is a uh, a different chapter, and every one of them has the name of the character at the beginning. It it literally just says, you know, Alan Warren, and then you go into the scene. Yeah, I listened to that one on audiobook, and the audiobook was. Thanks. No, I'm I, I've heard wonderful things about it. I, I really appreciate the fact that they do send, you know, they'll send, you know, three or four options for narrators now. Once upon a time, they just did whatever they wanted, so it's nice to get some choices. Are you able to listen to your audiobooks without, like, I know, like, I cannot listen to my, I, I can listen to part of my audiobooks, but then I'm just like, now I get all weird and anxious. Uh, are you able to get through one? I don't, I, uh, you know, uh, I just feel like I know what's going to happen. So I feel like my patience would be, I'm not a patient person. My wife would be the first to tell you. Your ghost wife. Yes, my ghost wife would be the first to tell you. She makes fun of me all the time about my impatience. How do you get into the mindset of your characters when they're not like you? I mean, so you've got a female like Kate. What do you do to get into that? That's a different, there are characters who are not like you, and then there are characters who are really not like you. You know, Kate may be, a uh, young woman, but culturally she's not that different from me. I've written female characters and female points of view and perspectives my whole career. Um, I've written over 100 books in 30 years. 
I've never flinched with that. And I think part of what helps me in that area is that, you know, my parents were divorced when I was very young. I was raised, my brother and I were raised by our mom, but also she worked 70 hours a week. So really was our older sister and all her girlfriends were kind of, you know, I've, I've often, you know, said I was raised by a past little lesbians. And, uh, and so I just feel like I had a lot of, I also always liked girls. And when I got older women, so much better than I liked men, you know, as humans, I don't just mean from an attraction standpoint, uh, you know, I just always found it much easier to get along with women. Um, and as a result of that, I think I had a lot of uh, intimate conversations with the girls I knew and the women that I knew as I got older that they didn't typically have with a lot of their male friends. Um, so I'm not claiming to be the, you know, the greatest writer of female characters around uh, by any stretch, but I do think that uh, I do it adequately let's say that are you sure you're not gay <laughs> um <laughs> i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure i liked the pause and then like i'm pretty sure <laughs> you have to double take well it's just that <clears throat> for me I'm, you know, being I'm, gay I'm and a lot of my friends yeah you know, well a lot of my friends and that we we are very close to the girls like we all talk about yeah things and it's not a not a big deal right yeah. it's usually you know the more masculine straighter guys that don't have that kind of intimacy with a woman that they're just friends you know what i mean yeah i think you know it's funny because i put that in the same category for myself as my passions for reading my passions for all the sort of geeky stuff nerdy stuff when i was a kid whatever it is that that a lot of the guys uh would sort of not not look down on me for but sort of like look askance like you know that they, they didn't get me uh, in that way. And it never really bothered me because I liked what I liked so much. Um, and so I feel like in that same way, I was never troubled by the idea that, you know, you know, and, and that's probably why I ended up fooling around with the sisters of a couple of my friends, you know, like <laughs> this, this is what broke bro code. <laughs> No, you know what? Um, I, abs I absolutely did, Jennifer. And if you could, if I would go back in time, I would do it again. <laughs> You're like, look, we have to live through our mistakes, learn from them, become inspired by them. Uh, you know, I would say, like, look, your sister has agency. You know, she's making her own choices. Anyway, but no, I, I don't know, Alan. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I know what you're saying. It's really interesting. I, you know, I think I was lucky enough, too, to have friends who were, particularly in college, I had friends who were from sort of all walks of life, um, who had different experiences, different lives. And I do think it made a huge difference that my sister, who is eight and a half years older than I am, uh, is gay and had, you know, tons of gay friends. I had other gay relatives besides my sister. I don't know. I just was always, I remember um, my first novel, the main female character in my first novel is bisexual. Yay! Sorry. Yeah. And, and and when I was, I sent out the first big chunk of the book to a few writers to try to get blurbs from them. Actually, maybe it was the finished manuscript. I don't remember. But uh, one of those writers was a horror writer named Ray Garten, who just passed away in the last couple of weeks. And Ray called me, actually, at the time. This was in, like, 1993. And said, um, like, man, I could never have written this. I, I, uh, I would never even have attempted this. And I was like, what are you talking about? Is that this this character, this woman that's bisexual? I would never even have tried to write that. I would never have been able to pull it off. It was just so strange to me, so sort of like it did not compute because that was just um, life, you know. So I, you know, so again, I I think there were a lot of advantages to uh, you know to growing up the way that I did. Makes all the difference. It's not unusual to you. You just grew up with that. Right. It's just life thinking. So what happens to your characters after the book's done? Do they still exist? Uh, yeah, if they survive. <laughs> if you haven't killed them off. No, I just mean, like, what kind of relationship do you seem to have with your characters? Like, are you the type that sees them, hears them, feels them? You know, is it like watching a movie to you? Or are they dictating to you? Do you have a, do you call them, like, brothers, sisters, or kids? Like, what? what is your particular uh, relationship? I guess, I mean, I would, I would hesitate to call them my friends because uh, some of them are awful. Um, but if I had to define them, it would probably be more like that. I don't think of them as my children or anything like that. What I, what I, the way I look at it is that um, 
very often, if I'm not 100% sure how a scene is supposed to go or how it's going to go, I, I will close my eyes while sitting at my desk and sort of, in my imagination, insert myself into the scene uh, as an observer, you know, and just kind of like uh, imagine how that scene is meant to unfold and kind of let it happen in a natural way. But occasionally there's a, there's, you know, there's a character that takes on a life of its own I, I wrote a trilogy of novels that actually we just re-released called the Veil Trilogy. The first book is called The Myth Hunters. And um, there's a character who's in that whole series who um, was not in the outline at all. Um, and while I was writing, the main character becomes aware of being followed. Uh, and when I wrote that the main character was being followed, I didn't know I was going to write that and didn't know who was following him. And when it came the moment for that follower to appear, I, this character basically created herself. All of a sudden, she became probably the third most important character in the whole trilogy. Um, and that just happened. It just, uh, and I, you know, writers talk about that kind of mystical stuff all the time. And I, it doesn't usually happen to me, but it did happen in that instance. Um, as far as whether the character is alive, I mean, I, I would think that any character who's, um, like I, first of all, I don't go back and read my books when 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 they're out. They're they're out unless I need to revise them for a re-release or do something like that, or unless I'm writing a sequel or something else in that world. But I do feel like when I'm done, if the character survived the book, then the character's still there, and and it's possible that I might someday dip back into that world or or you know write a sequel or what have you. But writing a sequel is sort of like just returning. You know, it's like you've been away from home for, you know, 20 years and you go back uh, and everything has changed, but some things have stayed the same, you know. Yeah, so I just feel like they do carry on when you're not looking. And so what do you get out of each book when you complete a book? A check? Um, yeah, well, is that, yeah, well, that could be it. Like some people will say that. Well, I just, you know, I work for money. Uh, no, I, you know, I mean, I do work for money because I have to. You know, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to make a living at this. Um, the reality for me about what I get out of the books is that uh, it's the satisfaction of having written. It's the, the need to tell stories. So it's you're, you're, you're feeding that need for me. Anyway, I know not everybody is the same. I was on a panel one time with uh, Jonathan Mayberry, um, who's another writer. Um, and Jonathan talked, talks with such joy about the process of writing. And I wanted to strangle him. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to slap him? I was going to say, oh, my God, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me how easy and amazing yeah, it is. <laughs> it's very, very infrequent that I have a moment where I'm really enjoying the process of writing. And I feel, uh, although I have to say I enjoy writing in other mediums more than I do enjoy writing uh, novels. The novels give me great satisfaction because... It's a compulsion. I mean, this is the thing, like, right? At the end of the day, like, all I ever wanted to be was a storyteller. Um, I wanted to entertain people. I wanted to, to get people to, to react viscerally um, to the story that I'm telling. And if I can make them happy and distract them from the world for a little while, the way other writers have done for me, uh, then I'm happy. Uh, and I, you know, need to make a living while doing it. Um, all, you know, when I was... Even before I went to high school, but in high school, I was thinking that I wanted to go to film school. Um, but then I thought, all right, well, let me go get the best education I possibly can as an undergraduate, and then I'll go to film school as, as, a, uh, you know, um, as graduate school. Once I was in, I'd already started writing short stories in high school. And once I got to college and I started taking more creative writing classes and writing more and more, um, I realized that that was really what I wanted to do because I wanted to control the process. I wanted to have sort of a direct conduit between me and the reader and just tell my stories. You know, it, it's, you know, so that I think is the, the joy of it for me is, uh, is getting to do that, getting to tell stories, getting to, to know that, you know, that I made someone happy, that I made someone cry, that I made someone laugh, that I made tons of young people, young girls. When I was writing my body of evidence series years ago, it was a young adult um, thriller series about a, uh, college freshman who goes to work for the medical examiner and it's sort of like scully in college and you wouldn't believe how many young girls i heard from who said they, they were going into the sciences um because of me or they wanted to do forensics because of reading these books and 
Um, I got an A because I started reading these books, or I'd never liked to read until I started reading these books. And, um, those things are the absolutely most rewarding things about doing this. Um, so it, it really is just this connection that you probably, most of which you'll never know, um, but just to know that people are out there enjoying the stories. What else could you ask for? So you mentioned that you get more joy out of writing in different mediums. Do you, which one's your favorite? Boy, that's hard to say. Um, because they all come with caveats, you know. Just the process of writing. I think I like writing scripts the best, writing like a screenplay or a, a teleplay. That's a really enjoyable way to tell stories because you're just envisioning what's happening and providing the dialogue. And, uh, and there's something really pure about it. But, of course, then you hand it off to people who... Then it becomes something else. See, I was wondering if, like with comics, like I back in the day dabbled in writing some indie comics and I loved writing it, but then I would remember getting the artwork back and being like, oh. Yeah, ironically, comics are sort of the opposite of film and television because writing the comic scripts is fun, but, but getting back the artwork is the pure pleasure, right? Whereas um, I haven't had any of my, well, that's not true. I wrote the script for the new, I wrote early drafts of the new script for the new Hellboy movie, which hasn't come out yet, you know, so I haven't had the experience yet of seeing the results I'm hoping eventually, and there are some really cool things uh, on, you know, on the burner at the moment for film and TV adaptations of my own stuff, but I can't talk about them. But I'm hoping that uh, in the not too distant future, I'll actually see one of my books adapted and so I can see that process. And I think that there'd be a a distinct pleasure in, uh, if it comes out well, you know, sitting and watching that. What if it comes out badly? (laughs) <laughs> no, and he's sorry. never going to mention it on <laughs> then air. And if it comes out badly, I will say that the book is the book, and it's still there. What's next for you? And I was, I'm saying this because it seems like you do a lot of titles. You write a lot of books. Are you doing a couple of year, two or three a year? Do you just kind of all over the place? Um, I've actually slowed down a lot with the um, – I'll turn 57 in July. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I have slowed down a lot. Uh, with books that come out, um, but in the last couple of years, I did I did three Hellboy Universe audio um, productions, um, which sort of took the place of some of the novels that I might otherwise have written. So I'm really only writing generally about one original horror novel a year now, at least for the moment. So I have a new one that I'm delivering this week, um, which I guess I guess I'm going to tell you. It's I'm not going to tell you about it, but. Uh, it's called The Night Birds. So I'm excited to deliver that and get that out, and, and um, that'll be out next year. I'm also finishing the edits for um, Brian Keene and I are editing an anthology of short stories set in the world of Stephen King's The Stand uh, called... I'm so excited about that. Uh, I, it's called... The, I really think about it every day. <laughs> uh, so do I. Well, you have to. I'm just an obsessed fan. <laughs> it's called The End of the World as We Know It, and... Um, and the stories, you know, uh, Jennifer, I think you'll be really happy. I mean, I'm I'm thrilled with the lineup that we've gotten. I'm thrilled with the great sort of cross-section of horror, um, of the horror community that we've gotten uh, to contribute to it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's exciting. I'm, I'm way behind on my comics, but I'm writing – I have to jump back on these, uh, writing a bunch of different comics for Dark Horse um, right now. And uh, – yeah, I mean, you know, the comics are a whole other thing. Tim Levin and I are doing an original uh, creator-owned series called Mortal Terror for Dark Horse, and I'm writing Hellboy in Love and doing more Lady Baltimore and doing uh, Frankenstein uh, New World. So this that's four different titles <laughs> at different times. Yeah, so only one novel a year, but a thousand other projects. Yes, exactly. Got exactly. it. Yeah, no, that's, yeah that, does, that doesn't sound like slowing down. No, and, no. and <laughs> well... As I'm saying, I'm slowing down in my in my production of novels, you know. Um, but but I'm still incredibly busy with uh, with many other things, you know, film and TV stuff, and um, so yeah. So I'm, and now I've got a hopefully uh, going to be figuring out what my next novel is. But I'm going to take a vacation before that. <laughs> Are you going to Italy? <laughs> no, I can sell you a house there. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually. Um, my family, I can't go because I have to be elsewhere, but my family will be going to Italy, uh, back to Sicily, because we've been there several times. My 
my wife's parents are, are Sicilian. Uh, she's, uh, they're both from Sicily. Um, and uh, the family still has a small home, uh, an old port town in the south of Sicily. How do we know that's real? You don't. No. I mean, the, the wife may or may not be a ghost. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the house all, may yeah. or may not have ties to the Vatican. The town. It's all a dream. The town may or may not be a ghost. You never know. Well, listen, how how do you like to be uh, contacted or do you like with readers and fans and people like that? Do you do social media? Are you doing a website? I am one of the easiest people on earth to reach. I'm, I My email is on my website, which is ChristopherGolden.com. I'm on Twitter, I will never call it the other thing. Uh, I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Well, we appreciate you being here. I appreciate you asking. Thank you so much. The book, The House of Last Resort. Christopher Golden, thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.